Well, hello, I'm Carrie Ann Chimsham. I am a associate arts professor at NYU in the dance department, teaching dance and technology, and also working as a wild artist in the field. <laughs> um, I'm James Gibbs, uh, a dramaturg and writer, uh, co writer on uh, Elements of Oz um, with the Builders Association. I'm Marianne Weems, I'm the artistic director of the Builders Association. So I'm going to jump right in there. I'm really interested in the Builders Association and I wonder if you can talk about the founding of it, how it came about, what inspired you to start this beast of a thing. Yes, exactly. Well, it was so long ago, it was 25 years ago, so it's all a little bit hazy at this point. But um, uh, briefly, I had been involved in a lot of downtown projects. I had. Um, worked with the Worcester Group as a dramaturg and assistant director. I worked with Susan Sontag as kind of a dramaturg and a bunch of other people. Um, and then I, uh, after a certain amount of, you know, downtown education, decided to reach out to some uh, peers who I was interested in and see if they wanted to work on a project. Mm -hmm. So we built this um, three-story house in a 70,000 square foot warehouse space, which is now the top of the Chelsea food market, but at that time was a condemned building, which cost $1,000 a month. Mm -hmm. And um, wow. we took about six months to build this house that was that used a lot of influences, Gordon Mata Clark, and um, a lot of the stuff I had worked with at the Worcester Group, and Ben Rubin, who was an early graduate from MIT and was kind of like a media designer before that even existed as mm -hmm. a term. And um, John Cleeter, who was an architect, and a lot of people who had no interest in the theater. Mm -hmm. So um, we took about six months to build the house and build the project, and over the course of that we kind of built the company. Yeah. And how did the two of you meet? Uh, so I came along um, at, uh, at the time of jet lag. Um, and. We Which met, was like 1999. Yeah, and so we met uh, essentially through uh, Diller's Cafe. Um, I uh, studied architecture and had just come out of architecture a few years before that and uh, started a company called D-Box um, that uh, does uh, and did and does um, visualization for architects and kind of morphed into like marketing, but also in a way it's like storytelling for, for real estate. Um, which is, was a little more commercial than we had anticipated it becoming at, at that time and we were interested in you know keeping our, our artistic eyes fresh and um, through Liz Diller met Marianne and um, you know were invited to contribute visuals to chat live mm -hmm. um, and so that's how my introduction to the company was from architecture and um, visualization and then a sort of slow process of <laughs> pulling myself into storytelling mm -hmm. which was which was a big interest all along and I had kind of uh, I'd had a mo like crisis moment at back in college, which was like architecture or writing, hmm. and so, uh, and now I'm writing um, full time as well, and I'm trying to write my first novel, and um, so, uh, the builders and Marianne have been a way for me to, to pull myself into storytelling, uh, and I'm still you know involved in the media, and and uh, and it's sort of typical of the company that people. Uh, don't have to restrict their opinions to whatever specialty they <laughs> arrived with, mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. which is which is why that's possible. Yeah, wow, that's so fascinating. That you started with this house and then architecture writing and mm -hmm, it's all mm -hmm. spinning together. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm so fascinated with Oz, with the idea of Oz, and as a young girl. You know, was swept away by the stories. Yeah, were you? Yes. Uh -huh. And so I wonder if each of you could speak to what Oz means to you, and sure. then and then go into how that has like kind of transferred into this piece. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, I can I can start. Um. I was I always watched The Wizard of Oz at Christmas, mm -hmm. and you know it was scared the shit out of me. The monkeys and the witch, like I'll n still never recover from yeah. this initial 
uh, exposures, but I I wasn't I'm not as attached to the um, artifact as some other people in the company. So mm -hmm. really, the way that I came back to being interested in it was Mo Angelos, who's kind of the main performer. I mean, there's only three performers in the show, so they're extremely virtuosic. But Mo is kind of the heart of it because she and 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 co-writer and co-writer. Yeah, thank yeah, you, yeah, thank yeah. you. Yeah, of course, go. Because yeah. um, she. She memorized it as a kid and practiced oh, wow. all the voices oh, and wow. like was really very invested in the world. And she had the voices like in her pocket. It was frightening. Ready to go. Frightening. Yeah, like yeah. the minute we started rehearsal. But she also um, knows all the apocrypha and you know details and gory you know stories about the actual making of the film. And oh, yeah. so just hearing her talk about it mm -hmm. was something that I thought would be great to put on stage. Mm. because of her relationship to it. Mm -hmm. um, so that's kind of one bundle. And then the other thing, the reason I'm interested in it is because it's this kind of like cultural, you know, um, cesspool where everyone feels like they own Oz. Everyone feels like they have some mm. relationship to it. Mm -hmm. um, and part of why we use these kind of YouTube testimonies is testimonials is because um, you just see that every crackpot on YouTube has some theory, some relationship to the material and a way of interpreting it. And um, in the years that we've been working on it, including our um, encounters with MGM and uh, oh. Warner Brothers, it is really clear that people feel like they own it. Yeah. Lots of different people own it in different ways. Oh, I want to come back to that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, mm -hmm. what does that How mean to you? Yeah, I mean, I, the same thing that I, you know, I have that childhood memory at Christmas time too, which is actually one of the reasons why it's so exciting to be doing the show yeah. now. Yeah, you know, because we always sort of thought yeah. of this as yeah. like this is the moment for Brilliant. the show. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I have that like you know polyester footy pajamas you know memory of, of like getting ready and watching Oz yeah. and like the mysterious commercials for like Good and Plenty and stuff that you had no idea what those even were, and um, and then you know also personally. I'm a gay man in my 40s, so I have that, like, Judy Garland, Friends of Dorothy, you know, mm -hmm. that's this term for, like, code term for gay men, mm -hmm. which is, like, I'm sort of too young to, like, actually, you know, have a memory of that, like, the 60s when that was really a thing, you know? Mm -hmm. And I went through a time, you know, as, like, a radical 20-year-old who read Michelle Foucault, like, <laughs> you know, adamantly disbelieving that Judy Garland should be important to gay people or something like that, you know, and now I've like come around to like loving her and like loving the artifact and the memory and nostalgia. So that's like the personal side of it. Mm -hmm. um, the more, the drier side is definitely what Marianne is saying, that those, those attempts to possess the story or, or to invest the story with meaning and, mm -hmm. and to push allegory onto the story mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. are also a big part of why we're interested. And that's one of the big allegories is um, this slightly crackpot, but kind of believable allegory that came out of the early 20th century um, like a school teacher in New England I think came up with this theory that the Wizard of Oz is an allegory for um, monetary policy in mm. the 19th century mm. and the gold standard and mm. the yellow brick road represents mm. the gold standard the slippers which are silver in the books represent the silver standard so it's mm. an argument about bimetallism and the cowardly lion is William Jennings Bryant this populist and the and it's, you start to think, well, this might make sense when you're like, the Tin Man represents the industrial workers, and the Scarecrow represents the farmers, and you put this all this stuff together. And, you know, I think it's, it's, it's probably not true that L. Frank Baum had any of that in mind, mm -hmm. but it's this great thing about, like, big mythologies, that they're, yeah. they can take that meaning on. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, so that's, that's the more... The low level is, is that nostalgia and, and childhood memory, but yeah. the, the more, perhaps more interesting thing to talk about is, <laughs> yeah. is the artifact the and the culture. Of metaphor, yeah. 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 And it's such a known story. Mm. Mm -hmm. Right, exactly. Yeah. So that's another reason to, to um, arm ourselves with that because mm -hmm. you can kind of like drop the needle in the record anywhere mm. in the, you know, and people know where you are. It's mm. not like you need to be burdened with narrative mm -hmm. in the same way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So what parts of the story would you say remain true and what parts are you turning upside down? Um, can you talk about how you're working with the story itself, the structure of the story? and, and um, 
Well, there's sort of several levels of storytelling in mm-hmm. it. Um, the most uh, sort of consistent is that we are um, sort of remaking moments from the film. Okay. So attempting in our most passionate and amateurish way to reproduce these, you know, the high points. Yes. So. And I saw in photos that you have a camera set up mm-hmm. and you have oh, a yeah. screen and you yes, have we do. projections and you're working with apps and so, yep. so how is that manifesting with so the main thing that we're doing is we're actually making the movie. So we are sort of focusing on the points of spectacle. So like leading into Over the Rainbow, mm-hmm. the tornado, mm-hmm. um, you know, da, 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 the flying monkeys, the walking through the technicolor door. The introduction door. of the technicolor. Yeah, yeah mm. exactly. Yeah. Right. So, um, yeah, and then what happens in the technicolor land of Oz. So like the flying monkeys and the poppies growing and mm. snow falling and all mm-hmm. of that. Mm-hmm. So, um, so there's a whole... You know, we're sort of touching on the creation of spectacle mm-hmm. and the sort of like the filmic container around that the cinematic container of spectacle mm-hmm. and then sort of pulling that apart as we always do and sort of creating a live film on stage so that you mm-hmm. see the labor mm-hmm. behind the, the spectacle itself and you sort of see the seams in the production, and, in and the, the seamless production. Shooting it out of order. In mm-hmm. Right, so the script is the production um, What's your, what do you call it? The production shot, the shot list. Shot shot list. Shot list. So you and hear it out of order, and year. then you see the playback in order. Oh, lovely. So there's mm-hmm. like, yeah, so there's playing with that kind of story. Mm-hmm. Um, and then there is this layer of um, AR where uh, some clever people in the company have developed an app so that those moments, those kind of high tech moments, are layered with <clears throat> this kind of augmentation of spectacles. So at these moments in the show, you're sort of cued to pick up your phone and see, you know, like the poppies growing or the monkeys flying or the tornado mm-hmm. coming towards you. So mm-hmm. it's meant to kind of underscore this idea of, you know, the heightened spectacle and what it means now to s- tell that story. Wow. So can I just say one more thing about that, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, so one thing about spectacle is that's part of like how we came to this too, right? Uh-huh. Is that um, the, we did House Divided, which was, which was, uh, you know, a show um, partly about the mortgage crisis, uh, um, the economic crisis uh, created by the mortgage crisis in 2008, mm-hmm. um, but also a, re- a retelling of um, The Grapes of Wrath. Mm-hmm. And so it was kind of like, well, this, these are the two ways people deal with storytelling in, in an um, upside down economy. And, right? mm-hmm. One is social realism and one is escapism and mm-hmm. spectacle. So Oz, mm-hmm. you know, the original movie, 1939, having been made at that moment of the Great Depression. Um, and actually the book was written um, during the worst great during the worst depression of the 19th century mm-hmm. um, so that was part of it like spectacle as a different kind of response to like hard times or confusing times right. in, so in escape is yeah. entertainment yeah mm-hmm. and then the other thing I was just going to say is that Oz has always um, from its inception it's attracted technology in the mm-hmm. storytelling so L. Frank Baum toured the show like went bankrupt one of the many times he went bankrupt <laughs> with like I can't even remember the name it's like the fairy log yeah, and yeah, radio yeah. but you know and it was like a colored slide you know um early attempt at kind of multimedia storytelling and then of course the movie is is it's not the first technicolor movie but it's early and it's mm-hmm. and it does make a point of emphasizing the technology like by starting in sepia and then crossing to technicolor so mm-hmm. using ar felt like a, a way to um, enjoy and have fun with and make spectacle out of this n- sort of newly available technology but but this felt like the right story to do it yeah. to have that fun Right, yeah. so there's like a dramaturgy in it. It's not yeah. just like, wow, let's make an app. Mm-hmm. It's like, you know, creating a layer that has a kind of like mediaturgical meaning. Mm-hmm. And working with AR is very challenging, I would say, yeah, having different. worked with it myself. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so um, I wonder in developing the app and testing it, how, t- can you talk about that? About actually like developing the app, how you tested it? how you decided which parts it would be used in and then also I wonder how do you get the audience to get it onto their phone does Mm -hmm. that happen before they come into the theater does Mm -hmm. that happen in the theater are they instructed how Mm -hmm. how is it well I mean I'm more interested in sort of conceptually how it works Mm -hmm. so um, we have uh, like a very loosely widespread um, group of collaborators who we sort of draw on for these projects. So mm-hmm. 
um, John Cleeter, who's one of the original members of the company, had, who's an architect, had sort of been getting closer and closer to AR. He worked for many years with Asymptote, which was another very kind of like high-end abstract architectural firm. Mm -hmm. um, so he sort of spearheaded this idea. And then Larry Shea, who's a dear friend and colleague from Carnegie Mellon, kind of came on board. And Jesse Garrison, who's also one of our video designers, got involved. So it's like, uh, you know, it, it's a huge team, mm -hmm. big team effort. Mm -hmm. And um, like all of our, uh, the way we make the work is everybody's in the room all the time. Mm -hmm. So it's hugely impractical, very labor intensive. Mm -hmm. I don't recommend it. But it's a great way to make something that's really integrated mm -hmm. because everybody sees what everyone else is doing, mm -hmm. you know, and we're sort of all progressing along together. So like the writing and the acting and the filmmaking mm -hmm. and the sound and the AR are all being developed simultaneously. Mm -hmm. So it was a great, um, it's a great luxury and it was a great way to do it because they would sort of throw something together and then we would look at it and be like, that's amazing or this doesn't make any sense. And mm -hmm. then they were able to go back and tweak it and so it's a lot of you know um, trial and error and and dialogue. Mm -hmm. I think is a huge part of all of this, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, and the app is also it's not only AR. Like there's a yeah. moment in the show where mm -hmm. different YouTube videos of of uh, people expressing their love for the movie mm -hmm. come up on people's phones all around the room, and there's a kind of audio cacophony of hearing you know sound from from the devices in oh, the room instead that. of uh, you know through uh -huh. the house system. Uh -huh. um, but just creating a soundscape. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, it's sort of a choir singing somewhere over the rainbow. Oh, but in yeah. a, from a million different bathrooms and, <laughs> you know, <laughs> everything from a bathroom to the Mormon Tabernacle Choir. Uh -huh. And have you gotten any feedback from the audience about how it is for them to... I think people love it. Mm -hmm. I mean, they love being able to have their phones mm -hmm. in their hands mm -hmm. during a performance. Mm -hmm. um, and it, surprisingly, it was, it's, I mean, everyone feared that it would just become this kind of isolating moment where everyone would be staring at their phones. But mm -hmm. you really see people looking over other people's shoulders mm -hmm. and sort of like mm -hmm. sharing this moment of mm -hmm. seeing this other layer of performance. So it has, it's become a kind of communal experience, which is really surprising and really great. That yeah. is really great. And yeah. I think that's what we're all seeking and trying to figure out. It sounds yeah. like you discovered right. something. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> and people don't need the people don't need the device. I mean, uh -huh. there's enough people in the audience, you know, that mm -hmm. people looking over each other's shoulders is enough for mm -hmm. a lot of people. So that's a that's a help too. Yeah, and it is a challenge to get people to install the app and all that stuff. I mean, that's just like help desk. We try to get people to do it in advance, and you know, mm -hmm. there's, there are those practical don't. issues, and yeah. there's an issue with the Wi-Fi. But mm -hmm. we've been able to sort that out, you know, seamlessly and not have to stop the show. Yeah. And it's pretty radical because. Um, we were among the first, or certainly among the first, um, people to use it in a proscenium context. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I'm sure Disney's doing it now, or trying to, but, you know, <laughs> the idea of taking the audience out of the dark and sort of making them active viewers is has been, uh, you know, part of the thing. Like, to say in theater, it's this kind of double-edged sword. Like, are you looking at the stage or are you looking at your phone? Mm -hmm. And how can we combine those realities? Mm -hmm. Yeah, going into that idea of integration. And mm -hmm. I always think about that when mm -hmm. I'm working with technology and how can it be best integrated to serve the entire concept. And yeah. The way that you're working as a group all together all the time allows that happen mm -hmm. and just looking at the images uh, on the website of the piece I saw the integration happening mm -hmm. I saw just like the layers that we're all working together mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so I applaud you that's <laughs> really satisfying to see um, let's go back to that idea of ownership of who owns Oz mm -hmm. and um, the things that may have come up for you while you were developing the work perhaps copyright or just the you mentioned a couple of names mm -hmm. um, yeah can you speak to that about the story and the rights and well we have um, had a challenging but uh, it, um, in the end quite productive um, set of discussions with the you know current owners of the the trademark of the actual film mm -hmm. um, and I I don't know do you want to summarize our I mean, y you know, the book is public domain. 
Mm -hmm. uh, and the movie is not yet because they keep pushing the copyright laws, you know. Oh, yeah. Um, but... Do you ever show the movie in the piece? No. 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 Um, but elements, you know, the, the gingham dress, say. I mean, you know, there's, mm -hmm. there's uh, you know, lawyers could argue either way about certain elements of that, you mm -hmm. know. And then there's also the protections of, you know, irony and, like, those, you know, there's so there's a, a complicated legal landscape around using... A, a copyrighted property to make a piece of art mm -hmm. um, and you know it's not it's not cut and dried mm -hmm. um, which is why we felt like we could pursue it mm -hmm. it's also why we ended up in discussion with them and uh -huh. you know ended up in a place where um, we're okay to do what we're doing mm -hmm. um, but you know I think it, that's a that's a broader you know that's connects to a broader conversation mm -hmm. that's not really about this piece but it is mm -hmm. a, it is something I yeah about fair use and public yeah, domain yeah mm -hmm. yeah and I would certainly, I mean, yeah, my point of view is that copyright has been extended. I think pretty much everybody agrees at this point, right, that copyright has been extended to the absurd length. And mm -hmm. um, this might just be rumor, but right, isn't the isn't the rumor that it's basically Mickey Mouse that that every time the copyright on Mickey Mouse is about to expire, mm -hmm. you know, Disney hires an army of lawyers <laughs> to <laughs> extend it by twenty years. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that maybe is it is it's right that they failed the last time, which is why suddenly oh, really? now you know in America every year we get like it's on like Buzzfeed right. or whatever mm -hmm. twenty works that are coming out of yeah. out of uh, into the public domain, and that never happened in our mm -hmm. lifetimes. This, yeah, that's this true. moment is the first time that that's happened. Happy birthday was recently released. Right, right, uh -huh. right. Which is like, how is that not a, just uh, owned by the <laughs> culture at large at mm -hmm. this point? Mm -hmm. right. right, exactly. Yeah. And so that's part of what the YouTube um, testimonials are about, are people, I mean, sometimes they use the film and, you know, show, explicitly show clips, although I don't know if we show them showing that, but a lot of it is about their, um, yeah, their love for the film and how their interpretation sort of contains the story, you know, owns the story in some way. So mm -hmm. that is really um, how we are sort of wor working that line. And how did you go about developing or selecting these YouTube testimonials? Ah, uh, God, I don't know. Did you and Eleanor and Will pick those? Yeah, I mean, I think those just came out of the, those came out of group discussions about dramaturgy, right? Yeah. You know, so th there's like the idea of like the monetary policy or the idea of Friends of Dorothy. You know, mm -hmm. particular ways that people have um, taken possession of the story, mm -hmm. and then we went looking for those, mm -hmm. and you know, and, and for the most part, they're pretty easy to find. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, I'm going to back up and ask you about Susan Sontag. It's a long like, back up. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, what can you What can you offer about working? How did you come about working? That was through the Worcester group. Well, I left, so <laughs> um, I had the privilege of working with Ron Fodder, who was um, a longtime sort of founding member of the Worcester Group. And um, we he started to work on a solo show um, based on the lives of Roy Cohn and Jack Smith, um, which were, you know, kind of about two men from radically different positions in New York, both dying of AIDS related complications, as was Ron. So it was very, you know, complex and layered production and um, in that, somewhere in that, we, Susan, who was a long-term fan of the Worcester Group, mm -hmm. said, um, why don't we do something, you know, he, she loved Ron. So um, we started to meet, myself and Ron and his partner, Greg Merton and Susan, um, in her, like, amazing penthouse uh, at the top of the London Towers in Chelsea. Mm -hmm. And... Um, had about a year and a half of discussions about a project that we were calling um, Strange, no, oh my God. It was about representations of de death and dying in cinema, sort of mm -hmm. a light, a little light topic. Mm -hmm. um, Dark Victory, the Betty Davis movie. Wow. So um, uh, we had just been pulling a bunch of texts and you know, I met with Susan, like, I think almost weekly in that period and started to pull together a script. And um, we all went to the Bellagio residency in, um, you know, Lake Como, the mm -hmm. Rockefeller residency, mm -hmm. um, and worked for a few weeks. And then we had a very dramatic 
um, moment where Ron was quite sick and ended up being put on a hospital plane in Milan mm. and kind of died on the plane. Yeah. So it was like this very, you know, ro emotionally roiling moment. Um, mm. And Susan and I just ended up staying in Bellagio and working on other projects. So I started working on Master Builder oh, wow. and um, she was writing to America, in America. Um, and so, I don't know, so we stayed there for like a month. Mm -hmm. So just, you know, we're in dialogue about our project. She was extremely generous, obviously. I was mm -hmm. young and idiotic. And um, she, when we got back, she was very supportive of um, Master Builder and became a board member and just sort of a champion of the work. Mm -hmm. And then many decades later, um, we did a project based on her journals, Sontag Reborn, which had been published, um, I guess, you know, probably like 10 years ago now. Mm -hmm. And um, so we were able to um, sort of get permission from her son, David, to use the material in the journals to create this, you know, semi- uh, like biographical portrait of Susan. So mm -hmm. there were sort of two layers to the production. One is um, the the conceit is that she used to write in the uh, margins of her journals. This so is she, so brilliant. So I wasn't she, really involved in this project, but it's mm -hmm. so great. Mm -hmm. She would go back to, you know, her journals from when she was 14, when mm -hmm. she was 60, and write like childhood, a terrible waste of time, oh, and wow. things like that oh, wow. in her journals. So, I mean, in the margins. Uh -huh. So we created this um, solo show <laughs> where Mo is playing, starts as the young Sontag, and we have an older Sontag uh, on video who's kind of like uh, puppeted throughout the, I mean, like chain brilliantly. Chain smoking. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> chain smoking and rolling her eyes. And she so, she, so Mo plays the live Sontag and then the older Sontag sort of comments on her. So uh -huh. it's like, you know, navigating and uh you know, the will to become a writer, to sort of become Susan Sontag, mm -hmm. is the story there. Mm -hmm. So um, that production played at New York Theatre Workshop for a couple of months and toured, you know, widely and, mm -hmm. yeah. So that's that's my story. Amazing, it's a thanks long for one. sharing that. Yeah, yeah. You should also say, wasn't, wasn't it Susan who really told you you needed to start the company? Oh, like, yeah. pushed that's you true. to start the company? Yeah, right. that's right. Yeah, yeah. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great. And you're writing a novel. Well, yeah. I mean, you know, I'm I'm writing my first novel, so you can just imagine what that is. You know, <laughs> I can't. Like, it's I a can't imagine. It's going to be brilliant. It's going to be a that. couple of years more, probably, of torturing myself. How long have you been working on it? Uh, well, uh, you know, what can I say? A lot of first novels, right, are semi-autobiographical novels and there there are people trying to walk that line of like dealing with their stuff and make art at the same time and that's true of this too so that's I think why it's why it's hard why mm -hmm. it's a long project and a lot of work because it's a kind of emotional work and at the same time I'm trying to teach myself and you know study with others like how how to write a novel so um you know it's a lot it's a, it's a big project and I'm not uh, I try not to beat myself up about the time it's taking and gonna take mm -hmm. But it's you know it's uh, the the sh the, sh the elevator pitch for for my novel basically is um, that there's not there's not that much written about uh, my precise generation of gay men who basically uh, came of age sexually during the AIDS crisis, mm -hmm. so right under it, mm -hmm. um, seeing how the society and culture reacted to it and mm -hmm. and and un equating. Um, sex with uh with the disease and, mm -hmm. and, and everything that represented so um so that's why it's you know uh hard work and, and work that i want to be doing and how is it co-writing with mo oh great god it's just it's so much fun uh -huh. it's such she's a pleasure really divine yeah they and, both are. yeah and she's and this is you know it's it's mo that marianne was talking about having the voice you know the voices and loving oz and mm -hmm. uh, in the show you know she's she she leads the audience through some of that and and her uh enthusiasm for the material is uh infectious she's a performer who's capable of of bringing that across for the audience mm -hmm. um and it's that's true of working on it too it mm -hmm. was just great fun yeah. is that mo's first time 
no, being involved no. as a writer? No. Like she's written. No, she co wrote. Uh, we both worked on House Divided. Okay. She and I co wrote that too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and, you know, and I should say it's not just a question of enthusiasm. I mean, we're. She's she's working on all the dramaturgy, you know, with me, and we're we're figuring the texts out together. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, it's it's also it's wonderful to have a performer um, on on that side of the process. It's it's very easy for uh, you know perf perform the the people providing the works and the performers to not um, see eye to eye mm -hmm. exactly. And mm -hmm. it's it's wonderful to have a bridge. Uh, mm -hmm. to that world, which is true of every uh, element of the builder's work, but it's mm -hmm. just been especially great um, working with Molly in that way. Yeah, it sounds like you have such a strong group collaboration, true, we like do. a yeah. family. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. I mean, there's nothing, that, to me, there would really be no point in doing this if I wasn't doing it with these people. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, mm -hmm. you know, it's very much about just sort of group culture and knowing each other so well and working with some of this most of these people for over 20 years you know it's like a very um specific shared vocabulary and mm -hmm. um that's what makes it so pleasurable is being able to use shorthand you know mm -hmm. rather than like i don't i don't know how people start over again from scratch with the new room of people for every mm -hmm. production you know mm -hmm. it's just a very different way of working mm -hmm. and so What's the future? What's in store? Are there mm -hmm. are there projects that you can speak of or ideas that you're trying? Uh, well, uh, we're sort of um, we're just beginning the seeds of an idea, so we don't really want to like you know mm -hmm. uh, spill the beans, curse it. <laughs> but um, it is called tentatively titled "I Agree to the Terms." Mm. <laughs> and um, can I give my my please. subtitle is <laughs> how did we get here uh, and whose fault is it? Ooh, <laughs> I love it. Yes. Maybe that's yeah. all we should say that's about that. That's all you need to say. <laughs> yeah. Oh wow. Who broke the internet? Okay. Yeah. So there's been so much success for you both. Um, I wonder if there's any moments of failure that may have like defined Constant. you or, or or that you like kind of really changed you or impacted you or led you to more to more wow where do I begin um I mean I think that like a, a sort of encapsulation of that is that we did do a piece. We did a huge project called the Imperial Motel Faust that was um, a long and heavily funded collaboration with the Swiss company, Theater Neumarkt. Um, and so we went to Switzerland for many months and did a kind of collaboration with half of their actors and half of our actors. And that was very much the uh, the sort of burden of translation. Like mm. it was really at a time where people weren't using media on stage yet. Mm. So I spent a lot of time trying to convince them that it was going to be, you know, there was a lot of like, but people won't be looking at me, they'll be looking at the screen, mm -hmm. you know. So mm -hmm. that was an uphill climb, like just really trying to, I guess, articulate our whole aesthetic project mm -hmm. um, in another, uh, m I guess more, traditional cult theatrical culture. Mm -hmm. So that was, I'd say, you know, difficult. And then when we came back to New York, we made our own version of it, which was this very quick, kind of funny, streamlined version of called Jump Cut Faust. Mm -hmm. So it was really <laughs> using the same material in a much more like, I don't know, American way, uh -huh. let's say. Uh -huh. So that was, that was a real experience in terms of like cross-cultural translation. Mm -hmm. But we have had many successful projects since then. We did this show called Aladdin that was about, you know, outsourcing. And it was a project with um, Modi Rodi, who were a collective of um, South Asian and Pakistani artists in London. Mm -hmm. And that, was, that went on for a couple of years, too. So I think it's possible. Mm -hmm. um, but it was, that is just one moment that comes to mind. I don't know. Mm -hmm. What else? How else have we failed? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, uh, the only thing, it, it's, I'm, it, having not come from theater, maybe everybody feels this way, I mean, I'll just say, I, I feel like it's, um, it's incredibly difficult to pre-visualize what something is going to feel like on stage and mm -hmm. feel like with an audience. And mm -hmm. it's just, it's a constant surprise to me mm -hmm. that you, something will look great, mm -hmm. 
on the page or the computer monitor or yeah. as a diagram or an idea and yeah. then you get it on your feet and it doesn't work so I think that that's you know it's that's not a large scale failure mm -hmm. but it's mm -hmm. it's just part of this process that you have to be prepared for to, to learn from the process mm -hmm. I think that's you know and that's Trust I, I the process. yeah and, and mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. and be willing to admit failure Defeat. or mistake and walk back and re, you know find <laughs> the other path and and it still that still surprises me. That, yeah. You know, yeah. You know, I really don't think that's true. Like architecture. You, don't. you know what I mean? Like I feel like right. you can look at a drawing, and if you your experience, you know yeah. pretty much how that's going to feel when you build it. Yeah. And you bring an audience in. You, I don't know. You you know better than I do. But even so, it's hard. <laughs> that's a, this is a hard process. Mm -hmm. It is. It yeah. is. It is. Yeah. I mean, I think that that's part of. Um, making something new is it's like if we just okay so I was thinking like let's take Oz and just make another movie let's take like Citizen Kane and use the same container but we will never do that yeah. much to our chagrin and amazement mm -hmm. so um, we're just gonna put, start with a blank slate and push the rock up the hill push another <laughs> rock up the hill so um, that is part of what's so hard mm -hmm. is because we're coming up with a new form for every single production mm -hmm. right so it's like we're all challenging ourselves to start from scratch mm -hmm. um which is why we don't know what it's going to be like <laughs> <laughs> but with the same group of people yeah so that's the constant yeah yeah we've got that going for us yeah yeah it's interesting because you said you know I, I don't know how people can like come to a new room every time yeah with people but yet you're willing to do that with with the concept or the art or uh -huh. the idea the, the, the idea is new yeah yeah I think yeah. that's true yeah mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. right so it's sort of get balancing I mean gathering pe the same people around an idea around mm -hmm. a new idea mm -hmm. as opposed to an old play with new people yeah right yeah how do each of you maintain your own practices um, like are you writing every day and are you, you know wh what is it that you do for yourself artistically to to keep the muscles flexing mm. what would you say good I mean it is I think that part of that is why it's so it it takes like two years to make a show from mm -hmm. the first you know inception to the actual premiere and a lot of that is just talking, like mm -hmm. talking about it and coming up with material like really between us and Mo and then sort of building it out from there. So mm -hmm. it's this kind of like incremental process in terms of like expanding the concept. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm not sure what I do day to day. I mean, I don't, I like, you know, talk to people and mm -hmm. I sometimes will take notes, but I usually am just trying to like, in a uh, collaborative space. Mm -hmm. How about you? Yeah, you I do? mean, yeah, yeah. I mean, in terms <laughs> of this this kind of work, right? It's like, you know, everybody has other responsibilities and, and things, right. and it's a it's a question of, of finding the time and making those connections. You know, in terms of my own work, it's you know, it's a mess, and that's part of my problem. I need to, <laughs> I need to have a better practice. Um, you know, we also just sold our apartment and bought a house and. You know, nothing works and I have all the excuses that everybody always has about that but uh, <laughs> but yeah I would not recommend my lack of uh, discipline process I think, right. you know. <laughs> I check mean, in I'm with also, me in a year <laughs> right exactly I am also a full time tenured professor so I have a right, lot of work right you're at UC Santa Cruz I am how is that but the good news well the great news about UC Santa Cruz is that it's a research one university mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. I'm there because of my work mm -hmm. and they are expecting me to do my work mm -hmm. so um, it's a lot because I'm also teaching mm -hmm. but um, I'm trying to teach certainly with grad students like how to do this research mm -hmm. so I'm trying to integrate it as much as possible yeah. and they've been supportive of the company and, and they the have supported the company well. absolutely yeah. they we um, we sort of had a test run of strange window turn of the screw the project we did at BAM last year mm -hmm. um, they brought everybody out to Santa Cruz to stage it which was like a wow. lot yeah that, that was is a big, lot. big chunk wow. so yeah, yeah. And, um, and Isaac Julian just joined the faculty there, so we're starting to work on a production. And so, you know, that, that's the ideal, mm -hmm. is that there's a space within the university for uh, creative projects, right? Right, right. 
I don't know. Does that work for you? Yes. Oh, absolutely. Great. And I'm really grateful for that. Yeah. Uh, NYU, especially Tish, is interested in artists who are working mm -hmm. and fully support us to go out and do our work and mm -hmm. then come back and bring that into the classroom. Right. Yeah. yeah. Um, so how, how do you bring this work into the classroom? Are, are you exposing your students to the work? Are they involved somehow? Do you? Well, over the years we have, uh, yeah, certainly involved my students in like every aspect of the production in terms mm -hmm. of just like shadowing designers or mm -hmm. um, helping, you know, with the production and touring with the productions. And so, mm -hmm. um, yeah, we've done a little bit of that. Mm -hmm. um, I have, I was at Carnegie Mellon and now at UC Santa Cruz, I'm starting this kind of MFA program called Future Stages. So, um, it basically involves getting into a theater with a mid, you know, very small um, media setup and just trying to teach them about sketching, hmm. like how to sketch instead of investing, you know, within the final product, mm -hmm. and also how to start, you know, rather than the traditional four weeks of rehearsal and then a two-week design, uh, you know, a panic bouquet. attack at the end, <laughs> yes. um, to really start with design as part of the strategy. Oh, um, so that is like new, it's still news to people in theater mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that that's a good way to begin. And you, when you were at Carnegie Mellon, you started a program there? Well, I sort of rehabbed the MFA program, the uh -huh. graduate directing program. Mm -hmm. And in terms of building that, like a future stages kind of space. So mm -hmm. yeah, we got our own building and set up a kind of lab and mm -hmm. um, yeah. Well, it's, a, it's a lot. Yes, it is. <laughs> I agree. Um, so when you're sitting around the table with your collaborators at the Builders Association and, and you're talking about a new idea, how do the technologies show up? How do you say, oh, yeah, we could mm -hmm. work with the camera. We could, you know, work mm -hmm. with cinema. We could use projections for this, mm -hmm. um, is it, yeah. Well, I'm delighted that it's taken till now for us to talk about technology because it really is not where we start. Yeah. And to me, it's really like so dry to just remove the, you know, the, the media, the dramaturgy from the right. actual container. Right. So, because they really do work hand in hand. Mm -hmm. So I don't think we've ever started out saying like, damn, let's use this new, mm -hmm. like AR is really cool, let's find a place for it. Mm -hmm. We really start mm -hmm. with the idea. Mm -hmm. And we have some set tools. I mean, sure, we've always had cameras and screens lying around. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. that's always kind of been a part of our vocabulary, mm -hmm. but it's never been the primary focus. Mm -hmm. um, and it's so hard to convince people that that's true. Mm -hmm. You know what right. I mean? Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. Like, it's yeah. just like, I you don't think really like want to talk about it. You think like you just start with a screen and a projector. And exactly. Then the and then idea. that's what it's about yeah yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> sure. yeah. Uh -huh. so um so it's quite mysterious the way that we have sort of progressed I mean if you look at kind of our path over the last you know couple decades we have sort of gone uh hand in hand with the um the emergence of different kinds of um com consumer technologies mm -hmm. so like we did a show about cell phones where you could see people two, three years before that happened. And people were like, oh, that's like 10 years away. Nobody's ever going to do that. And then in the time that we launched and toured um, Continuous City, mm -hmm. people were starting to have FaceTime. Mm -hmm. So there's been a lot of that kind of like 10 minutes into the future, mm -hmm. um, but not because we started there, but I think just because we're like attuned to the culture and mm -hmm. what's happening, you know, what's sort of emerging mm -hmm. in the ideas. So for instance, Continuous City, was about social connectivity mm -hmm. and sort of the emergence of thing like before Facebook. Mm -hmm. We were using something called, I can't remember what it was, a sort of progenitor of, of, um, of Facebook. So uh, we, we were very interested in that and the, the piece was kind of about how younger people think about connectivity and then 
what sort of burbled out of that was the idea of this first world traveler who's moving around the world connecting to his daughter at home mm -hmm. through a kind of FaceTime vocabulary. Mm -hmm. And it, so that kind of like all came about while that technology was emerging in the culture. Wow. So it's quite, um, I don't know, to me I would say it's really intuitive mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and it's not, uh, if anything, it has sort of a glancing relationship to like actually looking at the tools of technology, you mm -hmm. know, like the latest tools. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think a part of it is just that it's not walled off from that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, that it's like that the, the stage is not walled away from like the changes that are happening yeah. in our everyday lives. Mm -hmm. Right, exactly. Hmm. So I wonder finally, um, as a young child, was there an artist that you were obsessed with or that you kind of put your teeth into in the, in the early days of your life? Was there anyone that showed up and pulled you down the path of the artist or the writer or the architect? What a cool, uh, good, good, good question. I have to use that next time I'm interviewed. <laughs> Um, I'm not sure about when I was a child. I mean, I guess Maurice Sendak. But um, when I first moved to New York in 1905, um, I started working for a very radical arts foundation called Art Matters. And we, at the time, the sort of mission from this board was to fund the artists who fell between the cracks of other funding organizations. And so at that time, it was a lot of artists working with sort of radical politics and media. So like Jenny Holzer mm. and, um, uh, you know, Barbara Kruger and Judith Berry and Gretchen Leinheld and all the people from that generation, Gretchen Bender, were people that I was like deeply influenced by. Mm -hmm. um, and that's kind of how I came to the Worcester Group too, was through that foundation. But um, doing studio visits with like a handful, you know, like probably five of those people was very radical for me. And then I was also in the Whitney program and so I had a lot of exposure to them through that. Mm -hmm. So that was like a real turning point. Mm -hmm. hmm. How about you? Um, I, I don't know, this is, it is a great question. I'll preface this by saying, wow, I can't believe I'm talking about queer so much in this interview, but like, <laughs> you know, I think that I, I have this, this thing I've seen, I can't remember who I saw talking about this, but this thing that's a, it's sort of a common experience of like looking for yourself in art, right? Mm -hmm. Before you even know who you are. And right. so from a very young age, I think I was like, I had no idea what any of that meant, but like sleuthing, you know, to yeah. find, there was no representation, you know, mm. or the representation that existed was like Paul Lind and it was like coded and you didn't know what it was, you know, mm -hmm. as a kid. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, and then in, in, as it turns out, like everybody was queer, you know, mm -hmm. like, but like <laughs> being a kid and like, so like, you know, there was like David Hockney and like Andy Warhol, my parents were like, had interesting stuff around the house and like, mm -hmm. you know, the David Hockney, yeah. you know, book and like they, yeah. they didn't, they weren't worried about like exposure or anything wow. like stuff that stuff like that you know mm -hmm. and then a little later it's like Whitman Melville you know James Baldwin um, a little later Thomas Mann you know mm -hmm. and, and like just and you can just you, you know I'm, I'm coming up with more uh, writers than, than yeah. other artists but sure. there's some even for people like you know Herman Melville you know mm. although there's some pretty explicit stuff in Moby Dick but you can <laughs> you just you just know you're on the track of something that you've been looking for. Mm -hmm. And and I think that's kind of what drew me into this, was looking for representations before I even knew what I was looking for. Wow. It's such a delight to sit and talk with you yeah. guys. Yeah, too. it's been Thank a pleasure. You. Yeah. Thank you so much. Is there any last thoughts you want to share or quotes or anything quotes. you want to Just so we're leave. happy to be here. Yeah, yeah. yeah. we really are. Yeah. 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 Yeah, I'm really happy to be revisiting this show again. It's yeah. it's sort of so satisfying for us to do. I mm -hmm. mean, even though it's a lot of heavy lifting, it's like pure pleasure. Mm -hmm. So that's so rewarding, you mm -hmm. know, and it's really great uh, of the Skirball to give us yeah. the space to do that. Yeah, absolutely. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you.